Hi, I'm Lippy. And I'm Grumpy. Together we're Lippy and Grumpy Do Podcasting. In this episode, Grumpy's found the sound effects button, the return of Davros, flat pack furniture frenzy and unintended inventions. Now Lippy. Yes. We're using a different website to record yes. and i found something very interesting last week after we finished oh yeah did you why don't you crack out a, one of your really good jokes oh oh god don't put me on the spot like that sigh one of my really bad ones was um why should you always knock on a fridge before opening it i don't know in case they're salad dressing <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a control panel full of these little things. And also Love you can it. add your own. So do you remember this from a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> <laughs> that can be the new start to our podcast every week. <laughs> yes, so I'll be keeping these in future and oh, uh, no. adding them to my dashboard. I feel like this is going to end badly if I ever get married. There's just going to be a, a stream of little catchphrases being played. Yep, you've oh, got it. No. Okay, so enough fiddling with that. <laughs> anyway, we've, we've had the return of Davros, I'm we pleased have. to say. After a few weeks to presumably take over part of the universe. So he was following up on a story we had from last week about the carnival mm. and one of the circus acts where he stuck plungers to his head and left quite a large mark, which was quite funny and very odd to see. So I'm going to read this in its entirety because it is just brilliant. Very interested to hear of the misadventures of the Carnival Act involving Plunger, or Dalek Omni Interface to give it its correct title. Davos can recall from his childhood a similar mishap. It was March 1973, and he knows it's March 1973, because the Doctor Who story was Frontier in Space, which is really, I would say, probably 11 out of 10 on the nerd scale there. Yeah, well done. And Davros was kidnapped by his parents and taken to a children's ward to visit a sick relation. Davros says kidnapped because, had he had any say in the matter, the hospital visit would not have been scheduled for late on a Saturday afternoon. Anyhow, assurances were made that the ward had a television and it was bound to be on. Davros did get to watch his favourite programme. Amongst the toys in the ward was a widget, a rod with a suction cup at one end, some coloured rings on the rod itself, and a shiny ball at the other end. So by now you can vis visualise how this widget appeared to the impressionable Davros, and sure enough it got a fix to the forehead. <laughs> Time to go, is the call, and here the problem starts, because Davros couldn't pull the thing off. It was stuck fast, as the... Um, gentleman in the arena a couple of weeks ago yes sound of approaching grown-ups the widget was torn at right angles to the suction cup and it finally let go with a palpable pop i don't have a sound effect for pop yeah. unfortunately fuel that. that was close but it didn't end there. oh yeah it could do one of those but it didn't end there oh no because mother of davros got taken very peculiar by the sight of a huge red welt on davros's forehead there followed an inquisition as to how far Davros had fallen and how he came to land head first. <laughs> Faced with this awkward cross-examination, Davros feigns amnesia, as you do as a child, which couldn't have helped the situation one bit. To this day, Davros has no idea why Mother applied butter to the injury. Any thoughts? Butter? Butter. Now, I remember, because my mother and her mother before that had a number of some very odd treatments for illnesses and injury, and one of them was butter for some reason. Oh. They used to put butter on burns, which is pretty much the worst thing you can do mm. to a burn, is to put fat on it so it starts cooking. Yeah, That's sizzling. Just crazy. But it was in vogue for a while. And I do have vague recollections of my grandmother putting butter on injuries. I did some research today about it, and some say... When butter is applied onto your skin, the phosphate in it stops your blood vessels from breaking down. And the breaking down of the blood vessels is what causes a bruise or swelling. I could do with some of that on my leg. Well, maybe you should try it as an experiment. The thing is, if it's swollen or bruised now, it's a bit too it's late. Already, it's already a yeah, big old you, bruise. 
Yeah, you've got to do it straight away. I don't think it will help once it's, it's done. So, Davros, I don't think your mum was wrong necessarily, but um, there's no medical proof that it actually works. Yeah. My mother once put me in the shower because I had chicken pox. She thought it would get rid of it. Wash them off. <laughs> Wash them off, yeah. So that's, that's the sort of thing that we contended with. Oh, funny. Anyway, you've had some fun with flat pack furniture. Don't. I... We are garden furniture in today. And no, not today. Yesterday it came. Yesterday afternoon. I was so excited because we've been waiting for it. Well, not waiting for it for ages. We've been waiting for it to come into store for ages. And then we decided not to get that one, to get a different one. And it came and I was super excited. But all the chairs are in three par- uh, four parts. So the two arms and legs, like big squares. And then the seat pad bit and then the back. I was like, oh, it wouldn't be too hard to put together. And I read through the instructions and I thought, oh, it's, it's literally three steps. You just screw the bar on and then you screw the seat in, you screw the back on. And I was like, I'm pretty good at flat pack furniture. I can do that. Did the first one. It was a little bit tricky. Like a few places I had to loosen some of the screws to then get the base in properly and then screw the base in. Then came to the second one. Three hours later, it's still lying on the floor where I got so annoyed with it, I just gave up. (laughs) Oh dear. And I've come to the conclusion that today, that actually what needs to happen is I need to put all the screws in loosely and then tighten them up. Because where I've tightened the bottom ones, it's pulled the arms too close together. So then I can't get the back in. But anyway, I've decided though that the chair that I failed on, just leaving that. Chris can do that. It's still on the floor on its side, literally just chilling down here because I just got so annoyed with it. I don't even want to touch it. (laughs) Yes. The problem is with these things is sometimes the holes aren't quite right. Mm. So there is a bit of tolerance there that can cause all sorts of issues. But by putting them all in at the same time and doing them up loosely and then doing them up evenly is the correct way to do it. Yeah, it's just not the way the instructions told me to do it. Well, do you always do as you're told? No, and the instructions aren't in English. Well, how do you know they didn't tell you to do it then? Well, because it says attach part D to parts A and B, but it like doesn't... So I just assume that means fully attached. To be honest, loosely fitting everything first is the only way to go with these things. Yeah. But also, you, you run the danger of actually tightening stuff up so it's a bit cockeyed, which is yeah. not good. But so I've got in, one chair. Yeah, well, you were lucky... That's all I can say. Yeah. So when you do something like a cylinder head on a car, it's absolutely vital that it goes down square. So you would do them all the nuts or the bolts up hand tight, and then you would there would be a sequence of which you have to tighten them. So you do it a small half quarter turn at a time. I, Why is that funny? Because I've just read the part that says read and save below instructions before assembly, part five in bold and capital letters. Do yeah. not tighten screws until all screws and washers are properly installed. Tighten screws securely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so oh, I didn't the, read them. So properly. the instructions you read did say that. They did say okay. that in bold and in capital letters, and I didn't see it. Well, we'll give the rest a go tonight. And Chris just might have a lot to do when he gets in later. Hopefully you haven't mullered the the one that's on the floor looking very sad for itself. I didn't force anything. I unscrewed to try and get bits in and then it didn't work, so I unscrewed some more. So nothing, it's, uh, it's nothing's forced. I haven't forced anything. Good. Excellent. So well, as long as you haven't be okay. cross-threaded anything, then that will be fine. Well, I had a bit of a result at the weekend. Charlotte's elderly shogun has been showing all sorts of odd readings for both the temperature and the fuel gauge and it's obviously got worse and it's a common fault and it's a couple of resistors where the solder gets it's either a dry joint or it snaps Mm. behind the speedo so it looked like a relatively straightforward job so i had a good read about it got the speedo out got the panel off the back got all that in pieces so i got it on the desk ready to do the soldering so i've got my reading glasses i've got this massive magnifying glass on a stick from Lidl which is brilliant 
and I could just about see where it is. But the problem is you have no depth of field. So I've got this soldering iron going in, which is only just small enough, if you see what I mean, the tip. Yeah. And there's a resistor on the circuit board, a surface-mounted one, and it is four millimetres by two millimetres big. It is tiny. That is absolutely tiny. And I'll tiny. post a photo of the board with the 50p piece just to hammer home the point that it was absolutely tiny. And unbeknown to me, one of the ends, obviously the solder had broken completely, which was the fuel gauge. So I tried to re-solder one end, and as I t- as it melted, the resistor pung off the board. <laughs> so I managed to um, encourage it back into more or less the right yeah. position. And I keep looking at it, and I'm thinking, no, that can't be right. So I'm heating up and moving it a bit more. And then I'm worried about stuff on the other side of the board getting hot and then dropping off. Mm. So I thought, I'm just going to have to do this. So I soldered the other end very gingerly put it all back together and remarkably it worked no yep that's I mean, that not, is impressive well done yes it's something not only server. i oh hang on a minute yeah. oh hang on hang on let's do a i'm not going to get tired of that no so <laughs> i suspect some of our listeners might so you've been having some fun with your car as well oh, don't my car my beautiful car this again is to do with garden furniture we were going to pick up a garden set from ikea but it went out of stock and it was from the wembley one ikea store so chris took my car to work because he was going to go after work on the way home via wembley and then come home with the new dining set and then it went out of stock so he didn't hadn't needed to take my car but it was already at work at this point when we realized it went out of stock and then on his way home i got a phone call saying i've got good news and bad news what do you want first and i was like oh let's just go good news he said i'm on the way home i was like right good start that doesn't really fill me with confidence for the bad news <laughs> bad news is your car's got a dent in it oh dear Yes. Oh dear, oh dear. Followed by a lot of, but, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't me. I didn't dent it. Somebody's reversed into it. So I've got a lovely little pin, well, not a pinhole. It's quite a big hole, to be fair. In my car. In the bonnet. Thankfully, not hit the parking sensors, because that would have been a lot more expensive. However, they did run over with their number. Oh, uh, that's good. But now they're not responding. So that's fun so we'll have to see how that goes but we got a quote i got chips away man out other mm-hmm. other people can be used and he looked and he goes well where this has gone in it's made this pop out and i was like oh i don't know what that is cool okay so it's gonna be about 275 pounds plus that i was like it's tiny but apparently the color match is quite expensive what they're so. really good at chips away is color matching that yeah. they are brilliant we've used them on a number of occasions well, and they are absolutely superb we've had another quote from the dent doctor which <laughs> the name the name sold it yeah chris has used them before and they have they were really good they are a little bit cheaper than chips away as well so we've sent him both quotes and said this is we've had two separate quotes this is what it's come to do are you going to be going through your insurance and he didn't reply yeah. and then we got voicemail today so, I mean, I'm hoping he comes back to us soon because I don't want to pay 330 or quid to get my car dent fixed when it wasn't even me. I didn't even have the car. No, well, we can we can chase him down, don't worry. Yes, I well, know. he lives. So the, where Chris works, there's like half of it is offices and half of it's housing and he lives there. So I said, just go knock on his door or leave yeah. a note on his car to be like, excuse me, you're not replying to my message or sit and wait for him to come to his car with a little... Yeah. Yes, yes. Obviously, we don't uh, we don't condone violence. No, especially not over three hundred pounds. <laughs> no, but some shady bloke in a black leather jacket might just do the trick. Yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully that will sort itself out. But it's a bit of a pain, crossed. isn't it? Yeah, it's just annoying. Honest, but, uh, yeah. So, was it in the bonnet or the bumper? The bumper. The bumper. Okay. Did I say bonnet? <laughs> You did Probably. say bonnet, yes. I meant bumper. The bit right, the thing that is most likely to be hit when a car reverses into you. <laughs> yes, you're uh, you're obviously not been paying attention when you're talking about car parts. No. Now, do you remember a few weeks ago we were talking about Colin the caterpillar cake? Yes. 
and legal shenanigans between Audi and Marks and Spencers, mm-hmm. where Audi apparently were copying the Marks and Spencers cake. Yeah, I, I don't think his name was Colin, was it? It wasn't. It's Cuthbert, but Cuthbert, it was the right. um, the face they were saying was the copyright that that's right. had chocolate that's face right. with a little tongue sticking out. Well, it turns out the Marks and Spencers are on the other end of a legal challenge. So they've... Oh. Yes, they've put together this bacon naan roll, which they've been showing pictures of on Instagram. And it consists of a chili egg and bacon in a naan, which sounds really nice. The photo looks really nice too. However, this is a dish allegedly created by the Indian restaurant chain Dizoom. So, not unsurprisingly, they kicked up a bit of a fuss about it. Oh, 100% you would, wouldn't you, after? You absolutely would. After seeing the fuss they made about Colin, you would 100% be like, well, you've just done it to me, so yeah. I'm going to kick yeah. up a fuss. Absolutely. The problem is, I've seen a picture of this, and I just go, ooh, I really want one of those. Yeah, really and I know really, where to get one really easily. Nice. M&S. <laughs> well, I think they'd be quite easy to make, to be honest. Really? Yeah, I mean, the photo is a naan bread, which you can probably buy you can buy a plane one and the, or a helicopter one and it's bacon <laughs> oh you sla- slap some chili on the middle of the naan bread yeah. throw some bacon in and yeah. a fried egg on top yeah oh, that's that fairly straightforward banging. yeah and it's going to be nicer fresh i think mm. than not fresh particularly the egg and i think they've thrown some coriander in there as well which which we wouldn't do well, I don't mind coriander. I don't know it what just, the fuss is about. I, I don't mind the taste, but it's very overpowering. Everything then ends up tasting like coriander. But I don't understand why people don't like coriander, but they like cucumber, because that's exactly the same. It's True. Basically... I'm not a massive Mar- fan of either. No, I, I just find it it's a bit over the top. Mm. Anyway, it'd be interesting to see how that story progresses over the next few weeks, because undoubtedly there'll be a bit of um, he said, she said... 100% finger pointing and yes. all sorts of in the meantime if i try and make one i'll, I'll let you know how it goes oh yeah i would be hopeful that i'd be invited over for a taste test well i might try it before unleashing it but i think it could be a camping one actually oh yeah on a could... grill yes mm. yeah possibly although grills at breakfast are a bit tricky but or maybe even make our own naan bread how about that Oh, go all out. Absolutely. Why not? Why not, eh? So carrying on with the cooking theme, I somehow or other came across a story about a piece of artificial intelligence that scans a bakery production line and it identifies different pastries, different types of pastries. Interesting. Now, this was developed in 2013. It basically makes the bakery checkout process more hygienic. I don't know whether it's built into the tills or or where it is, but it's $200,000, so I guess it's probably not on every checkout in Uh, your local supermarket. Yes, But it it learns as well. So it learns when two of them are close to one another or touching. Mm. It's actually two individual items and not one. Anyway, bakery scan, as it's very imaginatively named, is also really good at spotting cancer cells who would have thought yep in fact at 99 percent accuracy this article says that's amazing it is absolutely incredible my one question does that mean cancer cells look like danishes i don't think so like a cinnamon swirl in your body (laughs) no i think i very much doubt it but i'm not an expert Mm. i would have thought it's the fact it's pattern recognition Yeah. So it's recognising a pattern. That's and it's different very good at doing to a that. Yeah, different absolutely. part of the body. So apparently it's been tried in two major hospitals at the moment. The article says it's doing a bang-up job, which doesn't sound like a medical term to me. That but, would be um, so good because I feel like working in recently in the medical industry <laughs> that <laughs> patients that unfortunately going through those tests and stages, it's a lot of tests that they have to go through. And like it's four or five scans before they even think yeah. about doing a biopsy. And then obviously the biopsy helps determine. But if it was just one scan and then you, they were like, well, yeah, if it says yes, then let's do the biopsy straight away. I That'd don't so think it's, a, I, think, I think it's at a much smaller level. So what they're talking about is analysing a slide of cells 
So oh, rather than have any, so rather than a human having to look at each individual cell to spot the cancerous one, it can look at a presumably a biopsy Massive slide, group. yeah, and just go bang. There's one, or no, there's none there. Oh, okay. And what this is 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 really learning, and it's although the computer software is very good, it's been taught by a human. Mm. So you have to go through that process of the, you know, so this is cancerous. No, it's not. And these are the characteristics that don't oh, make you have it cancerous. Oh, you input the different stage. Yeah, okay. Well, it, it, that's how it learns yeah. because it recognizes goes, I've seen this one before and it wasn't, or I've not seen this one before. So it will have okay. some sort so of Just because accuracy. it's not seen, it doesn't mean it is. No, absolutely but not. But it means no. that when it's seeing a cancerous cell, it can re-recognize the cancerous cell absolutely. quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's where it is. You know, the software on its own is not necessarily that clever. It's the, it's the human interaction with it mm. and being able to... The understand, I, it understands. I, yeah. And, and a lot of that is to do with the input device. So the, the camera that's actually looking at it yeah. is of such a good quality that you, you can pick up differences at a cellular level. I mean, that is astonishing, really. So that's the kind of thing that's going to start being able to recognise pe- different types of people and... I think we're pretty much there already, to be honest with that. Yeah, you look at some of the... Well, you look at you know even something like Facebook, when you put a photo up there and it identifies your friends in a photo. Yeah, oh my God, my phone does that. It's like, view pictures with all of this person in. And it's like, one of you guys. And then it pulls all the pictures on my camera roll that recognises your face. Creepy. It is a little bit creepy. Anyway, that got me thinking about how some inventions we take... You know, every day for granted, mm. have been invented by accident. Yeah. And I've got a bit of a list here, oh, which yes. makes quite interesting reading. So obviously the big one, the one that, or one of the ones that uh, most people think of is penicillin. Mm. Complete accident yeah. in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. Then surprisingly, cornflakes. How were cornflakes an accident? Someone just accidentally fall face first into them and they tasted good. It... Uh, it was basically an experiment into food, let's put it that way. <laughs> and they were making dough from boiled wheat. And one of the Kellogg's brothers, so the name comes from, left the mash to dry for too long. And when it came to be rolled out, it splintered into dozens of individual flakes. Oh. Curious to as what these flakes tasted like, he baked them in the oven and in the process called, created a cereal called Granos switched out the wheat for corn and gave us cornflakes see i want to know who decided to put milk with that well that's always a good question isn't it like who was the first person to go i'm just going to pour some milk over this stuff well i would imagine if you bought a box of cornflakes and tried to eat them and gone oh that's a bit dry dry. and they would have gone i'll have a glass of milk and then they just died to pour it over yeah Yeah. that makes sense same with trying to eat weetabix without milk is you're gonna get get stuck at some point (laughs) So number three on the list is Teflon, which is obviously on the inside of frying pans, yes. discovered by accident. The Slinky, discovered by accident. He, the man Richard T. James, uh, this is in 1943, was trying to modify a stabiliser for sensitive maritime equipment and not to spring over, and down it went. Fun. Yes. Turned into I the, thought, the childhood ooh. toy of a Slinky. Yes, it did. Silly putty, an accident. That doesn't surprise me that that's an accident. No. Post-it notes, which is another famous one. Or to be precise, the glue on the post-it notes. Now, one we covered a couple of weeks ago, saccharin. Yes. was an accident. Yes, was. remember that one? The popsicle. And lastly, laminated glass. So the glass that we have in vast majority of car windscreens, which is a glass and plastic sandwich, essentially, mm. was developed... Actually, in 1909, so quite a long God, time that's back. That's a long, long time ago. Yeah, a long, long time. Now, during the week, you sent a screenshot of, I did. Uh, of something, I think probably from Twitter, that said, I explained to my daughter that when Netflix started, they used to send you DVDs. Yeah. Six year old, in an old lady voice, you know, back in my day, the internet used to come in the mail. <laughs> Not far off. And not far off. So being a family chat, they got a little out of hand very quickly. Yes. And I can't remember who it was said, what's next? And Myself, actually. With, I said, I wonder oh, it was what's you. next. Oh, you. Okay. Yeah. wonder what's next. Uh, I was very helpful by sending a picture of Homer Simpson. Yeah. Actually, you suggested having it beamed straight into your head. He did. Well, the exact words I, I used was, 
download straight into your brain and project onto your eyelids so that when your eyes are closed, you're like watching the movie on your eyelids. To which Chris sent back a link where this is like a thing that's being developed already. So I'm a genius. I invented the idea and I would like to take credit for it. (laughs) Well, you invented it after it had been invented. (laughs) So I don't think that counts really. Well, within our, our family, I suggested it first. Well, Yes, but none of us are going to fund you to um, produce a, a new. Oh, I wouldn't even know where to start. No, so I don't. I think claiming you've invented it is probably a bit, a a bit far fetched. Anyway, we have a very interesting link which we've all tried to read, and our heads have exploded yes. basically. So it's an amazing piece of technology. Mm. It's breakthrough uh, technology with- for the brain. It is, and it is interfacing with the brain, which Mm. is quite something. So we'll put a link to that, if you've any experience of that. I'm guessing this is right up the Screaming Tomatoes alley, as it were. This is the sort of thing he'll um, he'll know a lot about. So I want to finish today off with a bit of a moan. Oh, no. I'm afraid. And it's been on our list for a while, but something triggered it back to the top of the list. And it's the use in films and TV of the phrase over and out. Oh, God. Now, I have a VHF marine licence, and I had to do a course for this. <laughs> and they make it very clear that you say something, and yeah. you say over, which means I've finished talking, yes. and I'm going to wait for a reply. Or you say out, which is i finished talking, and I don't expect a reply, or I'm not going to wait for a reply. Mm. I'm going to do something else. You would never have, I've said something and I'm expecting a reply and I'm not expecting a reply because that would be daft. (laughs) So saying over and out is daft. And I was horrified recently whilst watching Dr. No to hear James Bond use the words over and out. Absolutely horrified. Well, he obviously isn't as intelligent as yourself. Well, he, well, he claims to be a commander, and yet he has obviously hasn't done a VHF radio license. Who even knew you needed one of those? Well, you do if you've got a VHF Marine radio. Anyway, we were watching Bosch, which is a Amazon Prime series, which we've oh, thoroughly yeah. enjoyed. Quite new that one. Isn't uh, it? Yeah, um, it's a few years old, but I think I think we're up to season five or six at the moment. Yeah. And uh, he's in an aircraft, and he makes radio call to whatever the nearest tower is, and he finishes it by saying, out. Well done. Perfect. Good so work. Some, somehow or other, Bosch has crept ahead of James Bond in my list of awesome dudes. Well, I would not have expected that, but he used the correct terminology for a radio. He did. However, things then got a little out of hand, as they do. So I started investigating this just to make sure I was absolutely correct, which I am. And it came on to the phrases, Roger and Wilco. Yeah. Roger means, I've heard what you said, but I don't know what to do with it yet. (laughs) A Wilco is, I've heard what you said, I'm going to comply. So. Okay. Will comply is what Wilco is short for. But Roger's a really interesting one. And I'll put a link to this. And it's about... uh, pilot he says i can remember using roger at the end of my transatlantic flight when an air traffic controller in oxford warned me that a spitfire was maneuvering in my vicinity it was an unexpected piece of information (laughs) i'm not surprised (laughs) at the end of a trying a tiring flight and i wanted time to think for a second about how i needed to react if Mm. at all while simultaneously letting the controller know that i have received that transmission which is what roger's used for yeah. So it's a bit like where wife of Grumpy asked me a really difficult question and I'm sitting there thinking, and she's going, did you hear me? I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'm thinking, thinking about it. What I need to do is to say Roger and then yes. think about it. But you need to make sure she knows what that means first. Otherwise, she'll just be like, who's Roger? How's Roger going to help the situation? Yes, yes. And if you watch the airplane, the movie, then there is, I think the first officer's called Roger. Yes. And the <laughs> captain's called film. Over. Yes, all sorts of chaos. Mm. Yes, great film, that. Anyway, that's my that's my moan over. So over or out, never over and out. Roger. Yes. <laughs> no, that should be Wilco. No, because, because you... I don't know what to do with that information. <laughs> Cheers, never going to use it. <laughs> I suspect that's probably the case. 
Do you have a top tip for us, Lippy? I do. I have a top tip. Well, it's not really a top a tip, to be perfectly honest, but it's an observation. That... Oh, a top observation. Yes. A top observation. Well, that was hard to say. Top mm. observation. From myself is that... Don't put football before your girlfriend over the next few weeks because you have to live with her for the rest of your life. Which, presumably, if you put football before your girlfriend, could actually be quite short. Could be, yes. Yes, never been a problem in our household. No, it's not really a problem in our household. No, it's not really, but sometimes it's irritating, you know. Football is very irritating, in my view. I love, I like watching the England game as much as the next person, but there's, why is there so much faff around watching an England game? Like, just turn the TV on and watch it. Well, the problem is, there's a lot of very highly paid pundits on the telly that have to talk incessantly mm. afterwards about everything. It's the same with Formula One. There's lots of waffle goes on around that. Yeah. Um, presumably other sports as well. I, just, I think football's I particularly like bad. Over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of plans being made and cancelled and changed about all around where we're going to be watching the football. I, this is why it's so important that England get knocked out early. <laughs> because it, it stops all of that. And it will it stop... You know, the if, faff. Well, it stops the faff, but also the amount of excitement that's going to be generated by, is it tomorrow, The Yes, tomorrow. So it'll be in the past when you're listening to this. If we get through, it's just going to be unbearable. Sunday's going to be in. Well, the thing is, Sunday, if you want to do something on Sunday at eight o'clock, it's going to be very quiet everywhere apart from pubs. Yes, very true. So it's not a lot to do on, at eight o'clock on a Sunday, though, to be honest, is there? Very true. We were in London a few years ago. I think the rugby was on. It was the rugby, mm. possibly the World Cup. And we stood waiting for a bus outside Waterloo Station. And in the pub opposite, they, it was absolutely rammed full of people watching this. And we scored. And I thought a bomb had gone off. <laughs> I've never heard anything like it. It's incredible. Yeah, I went now, to I'm the ex- pub for the quarterfinals and it was very similar. There must be football-free pubs, though. Oh, you wouldn't know. The amount of money you'll be making. Like, the pub was... F- well, I'll tell you what, though. One positive that has come out of uh, you know, government and uh, rest- restrictions is that we had a lovely time in the pub. We could see the TV. Everyone had to be sat down. We didn't have any rowdy people trying to come and hug us or get in our way. It was lovely. Did you say roundy people or rowdy? Rowdy. <laughs> rowdy. <laughs> anyway, that's enough about football. <laughs> I have a fun fact. Go on, then. What's your fact of fun? It, it- it's a motoring-related one and history. Is it fun, though? Not really, no. <laughs> I don't know why I call these fun facts. Or maybe I should call them interesting facts. Maybe you should call them grumpy facts. Yeah. Fun fact's good because it's alliteration. Anyway, in 1914, mm. when Henry Ford doubled the pay of his employees from $2.25 per day to $5 per day, Damn. he didn't... Yeah, amazing. He did not do it for altruistic reasons. He did it to keep his employee turnover rate low. Ford needed to hire over 52,000 men for a workforce of only 14,000. New workers required a long breaking period and many would quit, which proved costly for the company's production line. Increasing their wages fixed the problem. So, you companies paying the minimum wage and complaining that people don't stay... Take a leaf out of Henry Ford's book. Yes. We actually learned about Henry Ford in my history classes because he was one of the first companies to inspire that kind of culture of actually your employees are worth spending the money on to keep them instead of just letting them leave and then getting somebody else that can do it. Yes. Unfortunately, I think, as it says in that that fun fact, that his driver there if you excuse the pun, was keeping the profits. Mm. Had nothing to do with the people. He wasn't paying them Uh, more because he appreciated the people. He just, if he paid them more, then it cost him less in the end. So Henry Ford was a genius, I think not a very nice person at the same Uh, time. I think there's a lot of bad things that came out of that. I didn't learn about that in my history class. No. Well, the thing is, he's iconic because of the production line. Mm. And his drive to get things done, there's a story about he wanted a V8 engine. There was something different about it. I can't remember what it was. And he tasked these people to do it. And they, they kept coming out and saying, we can't do it. He said, no, just keep going until you do it. And they did eventually do it. So he gave them the space and the facilities to do that. Mm. 
but I think other parts of the business, he was very profit focused and not people focused. Well, at least they were earning five pounds a day. Five dollars a day in 1914. That's That's a uh, lot. That is a lot. That's it for this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can help spread Lippy and Grumpy's view on life by leaving a review on your favourite podcast platform. If you're not sure how to leave a review, or if you download from Spotify, there's some help at lippyandgrumpy.uk slash review. And if you would like to get in touch, email podcast at lippyandgrumpy.uk. So it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye.